Hello and welcome to this Institute for Government event. I'm Alex Thomas and I'm a Programme Director at the IFG uh, and I'm delighted uh, that we're here today to uh, talk about the future of UK digital uh, government uh, and we're very pleased to be producing this event in partnership with uh, Oracle. Um, it's a big moment for digital uh, government. Uh, in the pandemic, uh, many of us, uh, including lots of civil servants and ministers, have got to know our uh, digital equipment and our laptops uh, more intimately than uh, we uh, ever had uh, before. Um, uh, 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 digital data technology has clearly been central to the way that government has responded to uh, the challenges of uh, the pandemic, both the policy and operational uh, tasks uh, that it's had to uh, address. Um, uh, and uh, regardless of uh, COVID and anything else, we're at a time when technology is uh, dramatically changing uh, public and private sector workforces, influencing policy decisions and the way uh, a, a government works. Um, it's also uh, the 10th birthday of the government digital service. So GDS is, is, is 10 years old. So that's another uh, another big moment for, for digital in government. So it's a really timely discussion that we're um, that we're having. And uh, in January, uh, the government, the civil service, announced its new structure uh, and new people to lead that uh, structure on data, digital and uh, technology. Um, uh, Alex Chisholm, the uh, uh, chief uh, executive, chief operating officer of the civil service, um, created the uh, uh, central, announced the creation of the central digital and data office to lead for government on many of these uh, challenges and support ministers and departments in their work in these um, areas. Um, uh, and we have today what I need to stop calling the big three of uh, government uh, digital because it will invite comparisons with who is Churchill, who's Roosevelt and who's uh, Stalin. And I don't want to go there. So that's the last time I'm going to it's the last time I'm going to say that. But we have uh, the uh, three leaders uh, of uh, this uh, uh, this uh, 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 digital technology and data in government with us today for what uh, I think is going to be a really uh, interesting uh, event. So Paul uh, Wilmot uh, was announced as chair of the Central Digital and Data uh, Office. Uh, alongside that role, he's chief digital advisor at the uh, Lego brand group. Um, and has lots of experience transforming uh, businesses uh, with through digital uh, means. Um, uh, he was global managing partner and founder of McKinsey Digital. McKinsey uh, and worked there for 23 years and has worked in all sorts of other um, uh, areas and sectors on uh, government digital. Um, Joanna Davidson is uh, executive director at the uh, CDDO. Uh, and before that, uh, Joanna was uh, the chief digital data and technology officer at the Home Office and has 30 years experience across the public uh, sector, uh, starting in the National Audit Office, um, but also has worked in the private sector with uh, PwC and uh, IBM. And uh, Tom Reid, uh, the, the, the third uh, of, the, of the trio, uh, became uh, chief exec uh, of the Government Digital Service um, earlier this year. Um, he was in the Ministry of Justice before that, uh, where he was chief digital and information uh, officer and has loads of experience across uh, government uh, and uh, also uh, outside. He was head of applications at the Guardian uh, Media Group um, before he joined the civil um, service. Uh, so uh, really pleased to welcome the, the three of them. But um, before we get into the meat of this, um, I'm uh, also uh, equally pleased that we've got uh, Claire Harding here, who is um, the UK central government uh, lead um, uh, 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 at, 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 uh, on HTM at Oracle. Uh, and Claire is going to say a few uh, words of introduction um, before we get into the discussion um, with Paul, Joanna and Tom. Claire, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today's session. Um, at Oracle, we're pleased to be partnering with the Institute for Government on this discussion about the future of UK digital government. As Alex said, I'm Claire Hardin, UK Central Government Lead at HCM uh, for Oracle, and I'm delighted to be able to say a few brief words before we get into the full event with Paul, Joanna and Tom. We at Oracle have had the pleasure of working with the Institute for Government for a number of years on numerous projects relating to improving skills and collaboration within the civil service. Throughout our partnership, we've worked on several projects and events on finance, people and capability and reskilling the workforce, to name just a few. Many of these findings and reports um, can be actually found on both the IFG and the Oracle's websites if, uh, if you're interested. So the future of government um, and the future of UK digital government, I should say, is of course something of which we, we think about a lot at Oracle. 
and we've been closely following the launch and early development of the central data and digital office throughout this year. We're also very interested to understand its work and how it sits alongside and complements the government digital service. I'm particularly looking forward to hearing from our guests today about the vision for the next phase of the transformation and the priorities for the next year. I think what we've all learned uh, from the pandemic and as we look to return into our places of work um, that is, is moving forward more than ever, digital must be at the front and the centre of government's priorities to meet users' needs. It's a perfect time to accelerate the digital transformation of the public services across the whole of government. I'm sure you're all eagerly awaiting to hear from Paul, Joanna and Tom, so please let me hand back to Alex and we'll get started. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claire, and um, thanks again for uh, Oracle's partnership on, on not just this work, but a whole load of work about civil service professions and uh, and functions that we're, we're uh, pleased to work with you on. Um, uh, uh, I, the way this is going to work is uh, I will ask um, uh, jo Joanna, uh, Paul and, and Tom uh, a few uh, questions to kick off, but we really want your questions. Um, so uh, uh, you should be able to use the uh, Q&A uh, function and we're getting a few questions in already. So do um, please put your questions in uh, there. If you can uh, say who you are um, and where you're from. And also uh, there should be a function where you can uprate the, the questions you're most interested uh, in, in hearing answered. So I'll keep an eye on uh, keep an eye on those and, uh, and, and try and ask the most popular um, questions. We've got a hashtag, of course, uh, uh, for the event and we'll be live tweeting it. So the hashtag is IFG uh, digital. So uh, do use that if you're um, uh, on Twitter. Enough of the uh, preliminaries anyway. So let's get into uh, into the discussion. Uh, Paul, I'm going to start with you. Obviously, as I said, you're coming from uh, outside uh, government. How, how do you see your role in all of this? How's how, how's the chair of the CDDO going to uh, are going to bring the experience of outside government to, to, to making government digital data technology? Uh, more effective. Well, thank you, Alex, and thanks to everybody uh, for tuning in in, your, and in advance for your questions. Uh, I'd like to start by talking about why I'm so excited to be here and enthusiastic about the topic, uh, which I think is um, really important, um, as, as we've heard already. It, the, the first thing to note, and this won't be lost on anyone, is that technology has profoundly changed the way we live our lives and continues to do so. We're now spending in the UK an average of eight hours a day uh, online, and we expect to get food delivery, bank accounts, education, health care, healthcare, spin classes, you, you name it, uh, all through the phone or the laptop. Um, and we can see that acceler has accelerated through COVID. It's obviously been a, a tragic event, uh, but digital adoption has moved forward by many years as a result. Um, so, for example, Across industries globally, nearly 60% of all customer interactions now are digital. And that's moved forward three years overnight. Perhaps more interestingly it is um, around 55% of all products and services have been digitized, and that's a seven year jump. So you're know, moving from services which were perhaps manual processes to, to fully digitized. And so every organization, public sector, private sector, is undergoing huge transformation to respond to all, to all of this. And that's about building new talent, um, uh, new skills, not just in the digital and data professions, but also within the business leadership. It's about improving the experience for customers. It's about automation and using data uh, far more effectively. Now, in all of this, the UK government has historically been a trailblazer. Uh, Gov.uk is remains the 12th most visited site in the UK, uh, and I think we can point to some great successes in the past. Right to remain more recently, uh, taxation, our online taxation system is really, really effective. And our response to COVID, the way we brought the, the data together from different departments in order to shape um, rapid intervention. Nevertheless, we need to move a lot faster. Uh, citizens need better services and better experience and expect it. Um, and your colleagues in the civil service should be either shaping policy or serving on the front line, not shuffling paper, and far too many still are. Government, need, government needs you know, continually better data for better decision making and better policy. And I think we also need to be investing in innovation because that'll help us drive the digital economy um, as, we, you know, as we move forward uh, post EU exit. So you, across all of this, I, I'm, I've been involved in digital transformations for in various industries and, and, and locations over 30 years, but I don't think I've ever seen a better opportunity to make a, a real difference. 
it's just a huge scope and a huge opportunity. What are my priorities? Well, first of all, it's raising the aspiration. So how do we uh, how do we look externally and think about what world class really looks like? Uh, we can and we should be the global leader in digital government. And you know, to keep the bar high, I'm in the process of assembling an advisory board of externals who will you know, help us understand what the, uh, the best is. Second priority is building commitment across government, officials and, and, and ministers. And um, you know, there's a need for us all to get on the same page in terms of priorities and pace. And then finally, and um, here I'm sure Joanna will, will comment a lot further, uh, we're building capabilities in the CDDO function. Um, and indeed, Tom is as well in, in GDS. We have a great team already, but we need more exciting talent at all levels. And if you think you can be the next chief digital, sorry, chief data officer for the UK, uh, we'd like to hear from you. But also, if you're just finishing school or college and, and you've got some technical skills, um, we'd also like to hear from you. We're, we're going to be in the market for a lot of, uh, of great people. So sorry for the long answer, but um, it's a really, uh, really exciting opportunity. We are going to be the world's leading digital government, and we're rather hoping you'll come and join us. That's brilliant. Thanks, uh, Paul. And we, you know, at the IFG, we're very happy to be a recruitment platform as well. So you know, this is uh, this is uh, uh, great, great, great stuff. So uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, lots of aspiring uh, digital leaders uh, are, are are watching and, and listening. Um, Joanna, uh, t turning to uh, you now. I mean, it, it strikes me that one of the one of the reasons why CDDO was created was to bring a bit of order to this complexity, to try and um, identify links, kind of cut through some of the uh, uh, the complex or, or conflicting um, uh, 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 aspects of, of uh, digital in government. I mean, how uh, how, how do you see uh, uh, CDDO um, uh, doing that, uh, bringing that sort of sense of order? while fostering innovation and not being some sort of um, bureaucratic monster at the center if i can put it uh, unfairly that way what's your what's, what's your take on that no great question and uh if may, may, let me let me answer that um in two ways i mean the first thing how to bring order so uh, what is it that we're going to do uh, so as, as, as paul set, uh, said we set the ambition around being the world's digital government and in order to achieve that, it, there's no magic bullet. It's not a single initiative answer. We've got to do a, a series of interlinked things in order to make that happen. So it is a transformation program. And if I just maybe step through the, the, the key priorities and the key things that we think we need to, to focus on. So first and foremost, and foremost, and we always have to keep this at the front of our minds, we need, we need to focus on how do we improve end users experience of interacting with government. That's actually what we're trying to deliver, whether it's a citizen or whether it's a business, how do we improve that experience? And there's some great examples if we look across government, Paul's mentioned a few of them of how we have done that. But, but there's still an awful lot that is not digitized. There's still a lot of paper in our system. And if we're honest, if you're a user trying to navigate um, government systems it's very disconnected there are a lot of broken user journeys and the burden is very much on the user to actually discover services so so we need to work as CDDO very proactively with departments to look at what are the opportunities to accelerate digitization leverage the benefits of things like automation agile working uh, and focus on digitizing end-to-end -end. We, we need to work in multidisciplinary disciplinary teams with policy operations tech in order to deliver an end-to-end -end transformation and, and genuinely transform that, transform that user experience. We need to do a few other things as well to support that. Um, again, Paul mentioned data, making data more accessible and shareable. Uh, we've, uh, within CDDO, we already have a data standards authority and that has made a really good start. It's been there for about a year. Lots of good progress on, uh, on, on defining some common shared data standards. But we need to do a lot more. You know, we've, we've really got to get into defining and promoting cross-government approaches on things like data registries, data models, and the, the, the technical infrastructure to support data exchange. So uh, that's why we think it's really important that we appoint a government chief uh, data officer and uh, to not, not to do it all, but to convene and lead the, the cross-government communities who, who are engaged. Next thing we need to do is we've got to, we've got to address uh, the, the, the technology infrastructure, we've got to modernize that. Really focus on how do we implement a hybrid cloud environment for everything that we do, much more modular approaches to how we architect, uh, things that enable us to 
reduce the legacy tech debt and uh, our cyber risk, but also enable interoperability, enable data exchange, and really maximize our flexibility and our agility to respond. And I, I'm proposing, I am going to appoint a government uh, chief te technology officer, a CTO, who, like the CDO, will actually be a, uh, accountable for ensuring that we get that cross-government approach in place. There's other things we need to do. We've got to align our project delivery, our funding and our sourcing and procurement strategies to support agile ways of working. They don't yet in the way that we need them to. And, uh, and it's really important that we do that in order to promote a much clearer focus on outcomes. And we're working and we'll continue to work with our colleagues in other functions, the Projects Authority, Treasury, Commercial, as well as departments, uh, and, and of course the supply community from a procurement perspective. So building talent, this is my, so, so this is my favourite, my favourite subject in the sense that for me, this is the one that, you know, we can do all of these things, but unless we build our talent, we're not going to make the change sustainable. And so it's really, really, really important that we, we put the right focus on this. And I think there's two aspects to it. One is what do we need to do for the DDAP profession? And the other is what do we need to do um, to build capability in the wider civil service to be able to interact with digital? Uh, so on the DDAP profession, uh, we're working with HR colleagues. We need to build a unified capability framework. Uh, we've got capability frameworks for DDAP, but we don't have a unified one, and that needs to align to a pay framework. And we need to make sure that we're building prof uh, career paths for, for, for digital data technology specialists that actually value their technical skills as well as their broader management skills and actually enables them to get promoted along those lines want to do more on apprentices uh, and, and I want to do more on uh, early talent generally and and really with an emphasis on building engineering architecture and data skills because those are those are where our really big gaps are not to downplay the other DDAP skills but um, but those are the ones that we really need to focus on building um, of the wider civil service for the wider civil service um, again I think we need to work with HR to build awareness to build the right training to help support competence development, to actually just demystify. Uh, there's a lot of jargon in DDAP. We've got to get away from that and actually make it a core part of what every civil servant should feel that they can engage with and, and use. So that's the what we need to do. Uh, the how, um, I absolutely agree. We, we can't afford to create some big central bureaucracy here. Um, the, 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 the good news is, there's, as, I, as, I, as I tell this story around government, there's a huge consensus that this is actually what we need to do. So I see a, a real potential that we can build a coalition of the willing here. Uh, so bringing together DDAP, bringing together the other functions, uh, civil service uh, colleagues and leaders, supplier partners, you know, to, to, to tackle how we deliver this. And, and we're already looking at how do we adapt our engagement models, our governance models, so that we can work more collaboratively on co-creating the response on this and, and, and create a shared view of what our strategy needs to be, what the goal, sh goal should be and what, what outcome we're looking to, to deliver. We're also looking at how do we refresh communities of practice because um, it's really important that we embed change agents and advocates uh, right across our community. So, I mean, we can't deliver this centrally. Uh, I, I think our role in CDDO is, is around uh, that strategy, policy, setting standards getting enabling mechanisms in place, but, um, but delivery has to stay with departments as close to the front line as possible. Uh, and of course with GDS for the, uh, the shared capabilities that we will need to work with. Thanks, Joanna. You teed that out perfectly to uh, uh, hand off to uh, uh, Tom. You've done this before. Um, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's, that, that's, that's great. Uh, thanks, Joanna. And um, yeah, demystifying, amen to that, uh, uh, definitely. Um, uh, Tom, um, picking up on some of the things that we've that, that we've heard, but um, I mentioned earlier that um, it's uh, we're coming up to GDS's 10th uh, birthday. Um, uh, when it was established, uh, it was given a clear set of tasks about unifying the government's web presence and focusing on public services and creating um, uh, tools of standardisation. Um, uh, a lot of that has been achieved. There's obviously further to go in other uh, aspects um, of it. But what do you see as the sort of the, the big idea, the big theme for the next 10 years of GDS? And I would add a kind of code to that, which um, we, we can pick up on later if it's easier. But um, there are already a few questions coming in about the sort of mandate of GDS uh, 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 as aligned with um, uh, CDDO and what the um, kind of reporting lines are. So um, picking up on picking up on any of any of that as well would be really interesting. Tom. Thanks, Alex. Um, 
Uh, I could probably nail that one really quickly, which is that uh, Joanna and I both uh, work into Alex Chisholm, who is the Chief Operating Officer of uh, UK Government, um, and we are sort of governed by the, uh, the, 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 the group that Paul um, is chairing. So that, that's the structure um, in sort of uh, organisation. I mean, in terms of the answer to your question, it's, it's I mean, it's, I, I'm whatever, I don't know, 11 weeks in or something now to this job, and it's, it's still an incredible privilege to to, to be standing on the shoulders of the people who have established and, and, and run GDS over the, over the last 10 years, not just the leadership, but all the amazing people who have gone uh, through GDS and are still there in, in many cases. Uh, and it's been a really good 10 years. I think we we, we, we can't lose sight of the, 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 the achievement that was getting gov.uk set up and moving all the websites into, into one publishing platform, but more the centre holding that ground and not letting that go again, which uh, I think is pretty impressive. Um, and there are really good digital services that have been built across government by by digital specialist teams in agencies and departments. My old lot of MOJ, where I've just come from, um, you know, some, some of the digital teams there are just utterly exceptional. So I think that that real success is. Um, flip side is I, I kind of think there's a risk that we've declared victory a bit too early. Um, and that's sort of in a few different ways. I mean, what one is for, for every amazing digital service that we talk about, like um, not having a tax disc and, and you know taxing your car or um, renewing your passport, there are probably 50 or 100 uh, that still require the user to have um, a printer and a post box or, or a fax machine um, uh, in, in many cases. We, we, we've identified 4,000 uh, services in central government alone that require downloading a PDF. So there's a lot still to do that we haven't, we haven't got to. Um, secondly, and, and Joanna made this point better than I will, but um, when 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 GDS was set up, there was a fundamental belief that I think still still holds to an extent, but not to another, which is that most people don't want to interact with government unless they have to, and want and you just want to get in and get out as quickly as possible. And I think for 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 the likes of of us on this call and and you know others in in our sort of socio socioeconomic group, that's probably true. I I only interact with government a couple of times a year, uh, and and slightly reluctantly. But there are whole millions of people who live very complex, um, messy lives um, for whom navigating government and working out what services are there, what are they eligible for um, and how do they access them? It's just really complex still. And um, so I'll, I'll be brief, but re really we've got three things we're focusing on then for, for the next five ish years in GDS. One is gov.uk itself, as in we need to keep that reliable, uh, up to date, fresh content really you know keep checking with users that it works it's critical national infrastructure uh, so we need we need to keep that up to date and not forget it um secondly whole personalized whole user journeys um i really want to start looking at things maybe life events maybe sort of types of people but things like turning 18 as a service or retiring as a service um, having a baby as a service starting a business as a service how can we use the data and uh, and and all of the different um, things we know about citizens and, and and what we what we know about how government works and make that simple for users. So that that's the second one. And and, and the third is is our sort of what, what I still refer to as our B two B arm, which is we 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 still should be building platforms and components uh, once in the centre that can be reused right across government. And that's not just because it's cheaper and you know efficient, but it's also because if we're going to try to tackle that long tail of four thousand forms. If we can go out to departments or agencies and say, look. This is kind of digital government in a box. Just plug and play and, and check here if you want help with installation, we'll send a team in. We can start really uh, uh, going by going wholesale, as, as Mike Bracken used to call it. We can we can sort of go at scale um, and, and get get that the 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 that long tail sorted out. So th those are the three things um, I think we'll be focusing on. Thanks, Tom. Eleven weeks in, and uh, plenty to plenty to to, to do. Uh, uh, picking up on your point about interaction with government, uh, as someone who uh, uh, two minutes before this event started got a text message inviting me for a COVID uh, vaccination, I was delighted to get that particular interaction with government. So, uh, uh, so uh, that was uh, that was that was good news. Um, uh, really interesting sort of opening uh, thoughts there. Thank you, all, all, all three of you. Um, I'll I'll come to questions that are coming in thick and fast uh, uh, in in a moment. But um, one point from me, and I think you've, you've touched on this in, in some of what, what all of you have said, but um, in my experience in, in government and the civil service, um, in, in the policy making world, um, uh, digital and digital services 
very much came too late. There was a, there was a, you know, it was about digital was about supporting policy interventions that ministers had decided decided to make. Um, uh, for me, there's something about turning that completely around and using digital data technology to inform and shape policy at the start, um, and also to engage um, citizens in the development of that policy. So I would. Uh, love to hear your thoughts on how best to do that. Uh, Joanna, I can see you're uh, nodding along to, to, to what I was saying there. What, what, what do you think the uh, CDDO and GDS role is in, in, in shaping and informing policy? Well, so I completely agree with the point <laughs> for, for start. You know, we, we absolutely need to do that. And, um, and I, th I think so, so partly my demystifying com comment points to that. You know, we've got to get a lot better at communicating and, and engaging with policy and operational colleagues. But I think there are some formal things that we are doing and that we can do to um, to, to help. Uh, so uh, we, uh, uh, Paul, can, uh, Paul may want to talk a little bit more to this as he will be chairing this, but we are establishing a new sub board for the Civil Service Board, which is the DDAT sub board. It will be chaired by Paul and uh, by uh, Jim Harrow, who is, as you, I'm sure you know, Permanent Secretary at the uh, at HMRC. And it will be a PermSec level board that will be the, 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 the if you like the uh, the pinnacle of our governance but but really important that we use that uh, as an opportunity to, um, to, to 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 get the message top down about the need to bring policy ops and tech together i can see paul waving so yeah. maybe you want so, to comment i was just going to thank you trying to seeing up that point i was just going to build on that to say that um uh, whenever i've uh, in my you know previous uh uh, life seen digital transformations really succeed. It requires uh, a strong understanding and commitment from, if you like, the business side, which in our case is uh, policymakers, ministers, and so on. Um, and um, that needs to go hand in hand with uh, uh, with strong capability in the DDAC community. And it's it's only when you you actually have all of that working that you get change in leaps and bounds, which is what we're aiming for here. Um, so we are uh, really stepping up in terms of uh, increasing the engagement um, across the, uh, the civil service more broadly um, and, of course, across government more broadly. So, in, in, you know, in addition to the, the boards uh, that uh, Joanne has uh, talked about, um, you, you know, we're also uh, reaching out one-to-one uh, -to, -one to the relevant civil servants and we're also discussing whether we can introduce, for example, new training uh, programs in digital and, and data, recognizing that um, this is going to be part and parcel of the way that government operates in the future. Thanks, Paul. Um, Tom, I know you want to come in and I'd be interested in what GDS as well can do uh, to support um, uh, government in uh, the point I mentioned about in engaging citizens in uh, in the sort of development of policy as well. Uh, I, I think that's a, that, 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 that needs a revolution. Uh, uh, Tom. Yeah, no, look, I, I I completely agree. Um, I think I think for a lot of for a lot of people working in digital government, and digital government is quite hard, right? It's quite hard to get tough stuff done. But for a lot of people, the the real mission is not building websites. It is using this these magical worlds, digital and data, that nobody can ignore, and kind of using them as a Trojan horse to get user centered design through. Um, and and I think GDS's role is to is to celebrate user-centered policy design, user-centered service design uh, and demonstrate how it should work. And I think there's a real there's a real challenge and an opportunity in this. So if you take um, if you take one of the examples I was giving about a whole a whole uh, a whole service, um, if you take like um, start, you know, having a baby as a service, um, there, there, there is no one person in government, whether it be a minister or a policy official that owns that whole journey. And so we will need to work with a bunch of different people from different um, bits of government policy and operations, but it all centers around well, if we're going to make head or, heads or tails of this, we, we need to go and speak to the users. We need to speak to mm -hmm. the users and go, how does it feel to you? Ignore, don't, 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 you know, we'll, we'll hide the complexity, the governance of government from you. How, how does it feel to you? And that for me is proper user centered design, ignore registering, but then ignoring the, the, the complex hierarchy of government. Thanks, Tom. The gubbins of government. There we go. That's one. Uh, that's one we'll adopt. Um, uh, really interesting points. I mean, uh, 
second sort of area of uh, uh, reflection uh, from from me, I'd love your thoughts on, uh, is the workforce and the government uh, workforce and how that's going to change and skills. I know part of the CDDO role is is uh, focused on uh, skills and uh, development, as uh, you've all um, said. Um, uh, Paul, maybe starting with uh, you, how's how's the government workforce going to change? How are jobs going to be sort of augmented? Uh, uh, or um, uh, replaced, uh, and what 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 do you think uh, the role of um, CDDO uh, and uh, uh, but also kind of departments sitting alongside that will, will be in 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 making the most of that that change, but also supporting people through it. Very good. The well, the first thing to say is that this needs to be a joined up exercise between CDDO and, and departments. So we are in line with Joanna's comments. We are uh, building a. Uh, in the process of building out a, a new vision for the way that skills, talent, capability, reskilling, and so on uh, works across the DDAP profession. Um, second thing to say is that this does take time. Um, you know, in, in any context, uh, what, what we need to do is uh, obviously find the right types of talent, new talent, and, and bring that into the organisation. That's per my opening remarks. Um, and you know, indeed, looking at the opportunity here. Um, uh, and you, you know, it's, it's clear we're going to need you know, more people um, and somewhat different skills. Um, the, th the third thing to say is that actually there's huge opportunities from reskilling and upskilling. And uh, I've seen that in, in numerous contexts is that if you provide the right type of opportunities for learning um, through um, you know, online learning as well as uh, on the job and so on, then um, you know. The, the DDAC community will have a high appetite for upskilling. Most, most of us who've been around the, the technology world have you know, been through various uh, iterations from, you know, I started off writing COBOL kicks and then with all this client server and then HTML and so on. So, you know, there's the technologists are used to these kind of changes and we needed to help people upgrade. Um, so, you know, there will be some, there will be some change, uh, but I'm hoping we make that change uh, inclusive uh, and um, you know, give people opportunities to really grow into the roles they want. Uh, at the same time, I think we recognise that um, maybe we've got the wrong balance for some of the critical roles between in-source and outsource. Um, so we are going to be looking for some of the particularly the key technical roles um, to be more in-house and that will require us, uh, as I've already said, to, to find quite a lot of new talent. Thanks Paul. Uh, Joanna or Tom, do you want to add anything to that? Or? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think, I think, I think Paul, Paul has said it. Uh, I, I mean, alongside that, maybe just to emphasise that, as well as upskilling the DDAP profession, um, we, we've, we've got to engage. We, 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 we need to work with HR, with our HR colleagues, to look at how do we digital skills and experience into you know, success factors, the way in which civil servants will generally get developed and promoted and um, uh, in order to help people you know, acquire acquire uh, digital data skills as part of their normal uh, normal toolkit in the same way as we expect our, our managers to understand finance and HR they need to be able to understand digital and data and there is there's actually a further opportunity there which is that although people often if they're not in the profession tend to think of digital data and technology as a very technical profession there are a lot of roles within within DDAP that that, that I think there's a lot of scope for uh, for crossover. So, you know, user, user centered design, uh, uh, product management, uh, some of the delivery type type roles. I think there's a there's a real opportunity for civil servants who perhaps aren't thinking that this is the direction their career might go in to to actually have a go. Uh, and we need to find ways to support them to do that. And do you think there's a, is there a sort of sharper end to that, which is that if you don't develop those skills, it's going to be harder for you to find a place in the modern civil service or uh, modern uh, government? I think the reality is yes, and that's not unique to government. I think that's that's a that's a that's that's true of every industry uh, and and and, and organisation these days. If Thanks. I could just build on that, I think what, one of the things that we're uh, hoping to do through this uh, program is to uh, you know, government is of sufficient scale uh, that we can help uh, create a new cadre of talent for the country more broadly to help spearhead the growth of the digital economy. 
um, because with the, with the kind of numbers we're, we're thinking about, we, we will have to have dedicated recruitment, training and so on. And, and that should, um, you know, as Joanna said, that should help every industry, not just government. Mm -hmm. And uh, back to the recruitment platform. This is uh, a, a great, great stuff. Uh, th thank you both. I'm, I'm going to move now to questions from um, from people who've uh, sent them uh, in. And uh, we'll kick off with uh, a, a slightly different subject, actually, but but uh, from Mary Susan Barry, uh, uh, who has asked how the government will ensure there's support for those individuals or groups who don't have access or have barriers to using uh, digital uh, services. Um, Paul, do you want to kick off on that? Yeah, I, I, I think. This is really important. We can't um, assume that everybody is willing or able uh, to use fully digital services. And um, uh, the, I, I think that what we're intending to do is to create uh, the option for everyone to access in time every service digitally, uh, but not the obligation. And uh, what I've seen in other contexts is, you, you know, this is the same in utilities or financial services and so on. Uh, that you provide the option, many people will take it up because it's convenient and quick. Um, those who cannot uh, need to be supported through other means. And typically that is, if you like, putting a front end in front of the, a human front end in front of the technology. So sustaining the call center model or a face-to-face -face interaction model um, um, in order to make sure that you create that connection to people who can't access the services digitally. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Tom or Joanna, also. Anything on that, Tom? Yeah, yeah. Um, and Paul, Paul said most of it actually. Um, uh, I, I was going to say something very similar. I think I think a really good example of that is um, so we're we're currently designing and building a, a single sign-on for government and a, a new identity uh, assurance program. So a way to verify your identity. Uh, so building off the learning of gov.uk verify. Um, it, it's really interesting looking at the user research we're doing. There, there is obviously 70 or 80 percent of people in the country have a smartphone and 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 access to the internet and that sort of thing. Um, there, there is a large cohort of people who who struggle with that though, who who don't have that option or don't realize, don't understand how to do that. And um, in, in my old job, I used to speak to a lot of people who are leaving prison, and often they 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 were illiterate, functionally illiterate, leaving prison with no money, nowhere to go, and and and. And we still were asking them to um, to 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 apply for universal credit, for example, and it's just bonkers. So I think I think we need a we need the human side of it exactly as Paul said. So options digital by default should be by default, not not by exclusion. Um, and I think we also need to make it much much simpler. So I think we need to automate services where we can, where somebody's uh, eligible for something. They shouldn't have to understand how the internet works and navigate to gov.uk and navigate to things. We should just go to them and say, this is this is what you're eligible for. We know about you um, uh, and, and prove your ID. And, and for them, proving their ID probably is is not, you know, for me, it's taking a picture of my passport, probably or similar. For them, it probably is getting somebody to vouch for them. It's probably going to the post office or something like that. So I think digital by default is 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 important, but misunderstood. It it can't be digital uh, exclusively. Thanks, Tom. And can can I ask? Um, I mean, this, this applies to, to this subject, but more broadly. But also, the extent to which you uh, feel that. Um, government ministers are signed up to this and the sort of involvement of government ministers it's it, it's it's obviously I mean clearly constrained in what you can uh, say by virtue of being uh, civil servants uh, we respect that entirely but it would be interesting to get a bit of an insight to sort of the, the sorts of conversations that you're having with ministers around some of these challenges and uh, and and uh, how engaged th they are with them I mean uh, Joanna maybe do you want to kick off with that well the short answer is they're very engaged and um, if, if anything you know <laughs> When Paul, Tom, and I went and sort of out, outlined our, you know, initial view of ambition and vision and uh, where we could get to, uh, the, the response from ministers was actually to push us to go further and do more. Um, so, so I think there's a real understanding, and and the experience of the past year has changed everybody's perspective on this, hasn't it? And ministers, the same as every as, as, as all other parts of society, they 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 absolutely recognise the opportunity and the potential. But they, they also recognise that we've been able to do some extraordinary things in the last year in, as a response to COVID that we are not able to do in our business as usual operations. And they are really hungry for us to take that, that really agile, flexible, you know, stand things up in days and weeks, not 
months and years approach to delivery into uh, more into our business as usual way of working. So, so yeah, lots of enthusiasm, lots of encouragement um, and quite a lot of pressure. <laughs> really interesting. That, thanks, Joanna. Tom? Yeah, I, I really agree with that. I think, um, you know, our, we, we, we mostly work with Minister Lopez in the Cabinet Office, who is the most enthusiastic and knowledgeable minister about digital I've worked with um, for, for many years, and she really gets it. Uh, and is pushing this agenda as as does uh, do, do other cabinet office ministers. I think the, the interesting thing is, so I worked in GDS back in the 2013, 2014 days where we had Lord Maud pushing this agenda. Um, I think the, 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 the position of the centre and the narrative is, is quite different now. It is very much one of uh, exactly, I think, Paul or Joanna, Joanna, I think you said building a coalition of the willing uh, around government. It's, it's knowing that there is there are skills around whole way around government. Uh, in digital transformation and in technology and it's kind of everyone's here ev most people join the civil service to, to to make things better right to do a good job you, you know you don't join for the salary or the, so you, you you join for that and I think I think tapping into that that sort of civic mentality that most people have and saying look if we work together we can make it even better I think that's what our ministers currently are bringing to the table that 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 is quite different from what we had before and in, in no way do I mean that as a criticism of what went before. It was it was absolutely necessary in that first five years to go big and push hard to, 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 to get people to notice. Thanks, Tom. Really uh, interesting. Um, there's a question from Anonymous, um, but I'll, I'll direct it at you, Paul, because it, it references you in the first instance. It says, uh, Paul mentioned better data in quotes, which is often said but never defined. Uh, what does that <clears throat> concretely mean for government and what infrastructure is needed to deliver it, Paul? Yes, uh, good question. And um, um, there, there are many parts of the answer. Um, so I think data, first of all, why? Why do we need good data? Um, well, in simply put, I think two reasons. One is for better policy. Uh, and second is for smoother, better operations and service delivery. Um, so we've seen during, uh, you know, during COVID that by aggregating data from different sources, uh, health data, um, you know, um, benefits data, um, um, furlough data and so on, that they've been, been able to create a much better integrated picture of the situation unfolding. And um, you know, in, the, in a, a situation moving very, very rapidly. Um, and that has enabled better policy responses to, to happen uh, in, in shorter timescales. And I think broadly, there's a uh, as a result of of that. Uh, uh, and Tom mentioned this. The ministers have sort of seen what's possible, and and how that can really help with with policy. The second uh, the second reason we need better data is in service delivery, and um, you know subject. I notice there's you know, interest in this, but subject to uh, privacy uh, considerations, sharing of data. Uh, will allow better, more joined up service delivery uh, in a way which is much more oriented to the need of uh, the end citizen. And so data can be really helpful. So that's why. Now, you know, what is it? Well, first of all, it's having the right legal framework for what you can share and what you can't share and, and when and why. Um, secondly, it's the right standards. So are we able to share or have a common standard for data interchange where, where it's appropriate to do so? Uh, thirdly, it's about technology. You have to have, you know, it's harder to lift data out of legacy systems than it is out of modern systems. Um, fourthly, it's incentives and behaviours. At, at the moment, it's quite hard from an incentives point of view for, for different departments to share data with each other. They're not quite sure what the risks are and the benefits. Uh, so we need to solve that. Um, and then I would also add capabilities, uh, having people who really understand what to do with data and how to uh, interpret it, how to present it. Uh, of course, we're in a world where data science has moved on hugely in, um, in the last few uh, last few years. And there are great tools available and um, you know, the ability to, to mine data for extraordinary insight. But the last thing I put on the list is, is a very clear ethics framework. We have published a version of our ethics framework, but I, I think we need to evolve that even further. And so, and so it becomes a, a set of very clear guidelines for how to operate and use data, um, which balances uh, these opportunities um, with, the, with the risks and privacy considerations. 
Thanks, Paul. Um, uh, and uh, as you mentioned, there's, there are a fair few questions um, uh, around uh, uh, this sort of um, area. So, uh, I mean, Joanna, kind of expanding on that a little bit, there is a question about balancing uh, the need to protect privacy with an expansion in government data collection and exchange. I also think there's a, there's a really interesting question about um, the role of CDDO in implementing accountability around data governance, governance and standards and uh, sharing. So, I mean, uh, Joanna, in terms of that balance, which involves a sort of fair bit of politics in it as well, um, and the accountability, um, uh, the accountability of uh, role for CDDO, what, 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 what's your take on that? Yeah. So, um, so, so the National Data Strategy sort of sets out uh, our, our, our UK ambition around how we want to uh, use data, but also how we want to ensure that we protect it uh, adequately. Uh, and that's that's a, a, a whole of economy strategy, so led by DCMS. But um, mission uh, three in the National Data Strategy is is a CDDO lead, and that's about how do we how do we exploit how do we how do we create the right um, frameworks to use data appropriately in government and um, we've got various tools to enable us and to support us in, in doing that we've got the digital economy act uh, which, uh, which which sort of sets out how data can be shared in a in a in a reasonable fair ethical way uh, and, and and various other um, uh, guidance and the the I mentioned uh, the I think I've mentioned this earlier the uh, the 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 Data Standards Authority, which is the group that is actually working across government to agree cross government data standards, uh, is also a very key uh, part of ensuring that we we deliver the right balance in terms of uh, enabling the sharing of data where it's appropriate to do that, but also protecting it. It's a it is a really difficult a really difficult balance um, to strike and it's, it's I think it's it's not something that we'll ever get to a definitive answer on I think it's always going to be um, an ongoing debate and an ongoing set of judgments about what's the right balance in the in the circumstances that that, that, that present themselves um, I mean just just uh, interestingly uh, you know, Paul and I were, were, were at a select committee on, on Wednesday uh, talking to the Lord's Select Committee of Public Services on um, on, on this very topic, actually, on 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 data sharing, and uh, and one of the conversations we were having there is that you, you have to take it on a case by case basis because that the actual subject there was about you know data to support um, services to uh, vulnerable children. Well, you know, few people would argue about the need to share data to support interventions to prevent harm um, to, to children. That's a very different scenario than you know, sh sharing data because. You know, it's useful to have information about who's doing a particular thing in order to inform um, a, 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 a decision on you know, some process. So, so it's it, it, it's very complicated. We have the mechanisms in place within CDDO to work our way through this and to work across government to uh, to develop standards that we should all work uh, along, uh, work with. Uh, but it's 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 something that will be an ongoing. Uh, ongoing debate. Yes. Um, thanks, Joanna. We will uh, be coming back to this again and again and again, I, I, I think. Um, uh, there's a question from Rob Anderson from Global uh, Data, um, taking us back to the sort of uh, central departmental uh, governance balance uh, of some of these questions. Um, uh, he agrees with you, Joanna, that it can't be delivered centrally, but how do you corral 18 plus different departments with their own delivery uh, priorities into a collegiate group? Doesn't the ICT funding model need to radically uh, change? Uh, I mean, Joanna, feel free to come in that, but I might ask Tom and Paul as well. Yeah, yeah. Um... So the, the first thing, the first thing I would say is that um, we are seeing, genuinely, we're seeing a lot of um, uh, a lot of commonality of views. So the coalition of the willing is not a buzzword. There's definitely a, uh, a lot of consensus around what we need to do, and 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 also how we need to do it. Which is not to say that you know departments have lots and lots of uh, conflicting priorities, and so uh, willingness doesn't always translate into action, given 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 all those uh, different priorities. My preference is always to um, uh, work with people and persuade and build consensus and move us forward jointly and together. But ultimately, uh, we do have spend controls, uh, and and within CDDO we have a uh, spend control authority over actually all aspects of. Um, 
digital data technology spend uh, and, and quite wide powers out into the ALBs as well as within core departments. So there's always that ultimate um, control that we can apply, but but generally our preference is you know, to, to use the, the carrot, not the stick. <laughs> I, I detect a uh, uh, just the hint of, a, of an iron fist inside the collegiate glove there. That's, uh, that's great, John. Thank there you. you. Tom, Tom, you wanted to come in. Yeah, um, I, I agree with, 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 with what uh, Joanna just said, um, as ever, I think. Uh, the, the, the other angle that, that, that I'd, I'd come to with this is um, we sometimes at the centre forget that when, when, we, when we talk a lot about uh, centering what we do on user needs and listening to users, we kind of forget that civil servants are users too. Uh, and uh, I think one of, one of the, way, the ways you build consensus is, is understanding what people are trying to achieve. Um, so so a, good, a good example, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing, a good example, I had a really good catch up yesterday with Simon McKinnon, who runs digital data and technology over at uh, DWP. And he was talking about some of the... Um, some of the uh, benefit services that he's trying to streamline and make easier for users to apply uh, and make it easy, you know, less less paper pushing, right? right less rekeying uh, in in there. And he was saying, you know, it, I won't I won't go into detail, but he was saying, if only I could get this bit of data from depart this department there and this bit of data from this department over there, I could just automate that whole bit of the process. And I said, well, that's interesting you say that because we're looking at how to map out what what APIs are available to each other, and it immediately was like, right, if we if we if we go all in on this, we we we're both going to get what we want. Um, and I and I think that's just there are tens and tens of examples like that. Everyone's roughly trying to do the same thing. Um, people are trying to get rid of their legacy. They're trying to automate their bits of paper being pushed around. They're trying to um, make make services better for users. We just need to work out, really understand what what people are after, what they're currently funded for, and therefore how we can how we can um, sort of help supercharge their their existing plans. That there will be friction points, right? There really will be friction points. Um, not not least trying to get our digital identity solution adopted. You know that that's going to be hard, um, but but it's not impossible. Um, if we build it and genuinely listen to to what people want from services like that, then there's no reason for them not to adopt it. Adopt it. And we may not, we never even, we may never even need uh, CDDO, Joanna's iron fist. <laughs> we'll come back to you in a few years and, uh, and check it out for that. That's, that's great. Tough, that. Thanks. There's a, there a question which I think you've you've answered uh, eloquently there about does does the panel believe that civil servants are users too? And I think a resounding yes is uh, is, is, the, is the answer to that one. Um, uh, Paul, this, this takes us a bit back into the sort of um, sort of policy or the wider civil service questions around this. And Paul, I'll, I'll come to you on this first. But it's a question from Chris about um, you know building uh, data pipelines and infrastructure is going to be uh, really important, um, but making data available is only a small part of the challenge. Um, uh, is there more to do, and how will you go about helping civil servants more broadly derive meaningful insights from data once it's available, and not drawing the wrong conclusions or uh, 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 in, or damaging conclusions from that data? I mean, uh, Paul, how, how, do you, how do you see the kind of broad role of CDDO in helping data literacy uh, and uh, an insight in, in in government? Yeah, absolutely. It's a critical point. Um, I, I remember seeing a rule of thumb somewhere that uh, one really good data scientist could uh, could keep ten so-called translators busy, and a translator being someone who can you know make make sense of the data and and actually implement it in a policy or operational sense. Um, so in in a way, this is the um, the bigger challenge uh, numerically um, is that we need to raise the level of data lit literacy across the civil service and across uh, uh, government too. Um, there's uh, you know and. This, this is another of those challenges, which is the same in any in any sector. It's not just government that has the, the same set of, of challenges. Um, so how do we do that? I think a lot of it is education. Uh, it, it's providing the right kind of training. There are, there are already um, training programs out there. Uh, number 10 is running a, a, on a small scale, a training program on data already. Um, and uh, you know, we will be building and expanding on, on that. Um, it, it's also about you know, role modeling. Uh, I think the more that ministers and, um, and senior officials ask for data, the, the more that uh, the more that data will be forthcoming, and the, and the better the usage will be. And it's partly about tooling. Um, I think if you give people very good tools to, to interpret, manage, and visualize data, then you get better usage from it. 
Thanks, Paul. Tom. Yeah, I, we, we, we're a little careful not to go into too too choppy waters here, but I, I I think Chris is raising a really good point there, which is which is which is that that we we need to respect that um, a lot of our data set will will just be uh, contain a lot of existing bias uh, in 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 some areas and a lot of existing um, um, inequalities and so on. And so I think I think we we they're, they're, along with just teaching people how to be better with data, we do need to teach people in the civil service right across the civil service. Um, how how to interpret complex data, particularly, and I don't think we're nearly there yet, by the way, I think we're another five or 10 years off, but if we, when we start authentically using uh, AI and machine learning to augment decision-making uh, in, in the civil service, we, we just have to be really, really clear on the provenance of data and any biases that, that are in there. So I, I think this is it's not, I don't think it's so much for, for me actually at the moment, I think it's more in, in, in uh, Joanna's space, but it's something we really need to look at um, as, as we start getting better with data. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and uh, Joanna, I'll come to you th with this one, but there's a, a short, uh, sharp and very interesting question from Paul W uh, about uh, uh, how the new structures will relate to local government. Uh, uh, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, we um, we don't have a direct uh, relationship with uh, local government from uh, from the perspective of things like spend controls uh, because you know that they have their own um, governance models and uh, and uh, accountabilities. But we do have very good contacts through into local government networks, obviously through the um, the Department of, uh, of of Housing and Local Government as well. And so in terms of everything we do around uh, our service standard, our technology code of practice, uh, data standards, all of that is is shared and available and we we, we interact uh, quite regularly with uh, with local government um, bodies to, uh, to to help um, uh, develop that and also help them think about how they, they take it into their into their context. Thanks, Joanna. Tom, Paul, anything to add on? Uh, yeah, I've got I've got a quick point if I may. Sorry to didn't no, jump all over you there, did I? Uh, but um, uh, quick, so two two quick things to add to what Joanna said. What one is that the the existing government as a platform products that we have, like gov to Pay and Notify, the the lion's share of the users uh, actually of, of those are local governments, uh, local government organisations rather than central governments. Really, it's like. Build they, before my time. People, you know, great people have built these really interesting products, and and they're being used more in local government than, than central government. The and, and I think that's good. We we keep we need to keep offering these out to, to anyone uh, to, for whom uh, it, it would be useful. Secondly, if we're really going to get serious about whole life journeys, uh, you know, life events, whole whole journeys, we're going to have to start talking to the NHS, social care, local local governments. Mm. There's there's no point in saying. You know, back to my earlier example, having a baby is a service, but for everything else, you need to go and speak to your local your local council. That's not gonna that's not gonna fly with people. I don't think I don't think citizens see the differentiation quite so starkly. They they just see you know different bits of government. Um, so so it's going to be a challenge. And, and as Joanne says, we don't sort of have a mandate over that. Um, but but I'd be astonished if if for, from the really good local government leaders I know, if, if they weren't willing and keen to to join in on this. Thanks, Tom. We've uh, just got a couple of minutes left, so I've got one final question that I'm going to direct to Paul because it's an important one from uh, Hillary, and then we'll we'll wrap up. But um, uh, she asks, uh, how are you sourcing your digital advisory board members to ensure it brings a dynamic and diverse range of fresh ideas and experience? So great to get your take on sort of diversity of, of thinking and of, of backgrounds, Paul, and then we'll then we'll wrap up. Well, I'm a huge fan of diversity of, of, of in every sense because. Um, all of the, the research that I've seen suggests that it leads to better outcomes, provably. Um, so we, um, we have reached broadly um, and um, I think assembled a very, uh, very big, interesting long list um, uh, for, the, for the panel. Um, I, I obviously, we're not in a stage to talk about individuals, um, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, there are some uh, uh, very, uh, you know, very experienced individuals and very capable individuals. We're currently this week going through shortlisting. Uh, and as we do that, we, we are doing so in a way as to build diversity of background, 
diversity of thought, gender, visual, in every respect, um, uh, to the extent possible, because I, I genuinely believe that will lead to better answers. What, one of the points I have um, made throughout is that there's no template for this situation. Uh, you, we are borrowing, and in fact, we you know, only today, Joanna and I were learning from another uh, national government abroad, but we're, we're reaching out, we're talking to Australia, to the US and so on, uh, to understand all the, all the different uh, models that have been used and ways to transform. But this is a unique situation. Um, and so we need genuine fresh thinking and we're trying to assemble that. Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. And uh, on that note, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to say thank you to uh, the panel for all your uh, contributions. I found that a really interesting, uh, interesting discussion. Thanks to Claire and Oracle for their partnership uh, of this event and uh, many other uh, interesting bits of uh, work that we, we, we do at the uh, IFG. Um, thank you to all of you for your uh, uh, for watching and for your questions. Um, uh, uh, sorry, we couldn't get to uh, all of them, um, but they were pushing 100 by my count. So, uh, uh, so apologies for that. Um, uh, the uh, recording of the event uh, will be available um, uh, on the IFG's website shortly and keep an eye out for future events, including a really interesting data bites coming up next uh, week. So thank you all uh, and uh, do keep an eye out for future IFG work. <laughs>